Welcome to Rune Soup, a weekly podcast about magic, culture, and the paranormal. My name is Gordon, and I shall be your host. This week, we welcome back an oft-requested guest, Dr. Jeff Kripal. Jeff is a scholar of comparative religion based at Rice University and the author of many important books that are name-checked regularly on this show or the blog, soon to be included by his latest one, Secret Body, which he joins us to discuss today. Dr. Kripal, welcome back. Happy to be back. Well, uh, congratulations on this, your best book, if I may say. <laughs> well, thank you for saying that. I, that's that's a compliment, I take it. Oh, absolutely. I, I loved it. It genuinely was one of the best books I can recall reading. So uh, so I'm really looking forward to this chat. Great. Oh, I can't wait to hear what you have to say. All right. So we'll begin uh, with why this book, which... I think we could fairly describe as a summation or re-exploration of uh, a lot of your previous published work. And why now? Are you leaving us, Dr. Kripal? <laughs> no, I'm not leaving. I'm not leaving. I'm not going anywhere. Good. I expect um, 10 more books. Yeah. No, this, this, there's really two reasons behind this book. One, one is it's kind of, it comes out of my lecturing experience where I, travel to different universities in both Europe and the States, and everyone seems to associate me with a different book. And it's, it's, it's a book I've written, but it's a completely different book, and they don't seem to know about the other books. And so I sort of realized that I really couldn't expect anyone to read six books and figure out what they have in common. And so I, it was my responsibility to do that. Uh, and the second reason was I myself wasn't so sure if the books had some deeper subtext to them, if they were bound together in some way. And I wanted I wanted to find out. Um, and so it was really kind of a, an intellectual, spiritual exercise in trying to figure out what it is I think and whether there were some deeper threads in all of these different topics. It's interesting you say that because... Uh... Prior to this book, I have a sort of Dr. Jeff combo that I will recommend to people depending on their interest or where it comes up in a combination. So I would like, or a conversation rather. So there's a sort of uh, Essel and Serpent's Gift combo for one group of people. And there's like, a, <laughs> there's an author's supernatural combo for other people for conversations that tend to happen later in the evening. But now I have this right. one. <laughs> now I say, oh, yeah, you just read Secret Body. Right. Well, that's why I wrote it, actually. And, you know, what? what's left out of both of your combos is, for the most part, a lot of the early stuff on uh, sexuality and mysticism. And um, so, I mean, it, there's a lot, there's a lot kind of going on in that those different books, and this one's designed to pull it all together. Well, it does. So, um, I mean, we just mentioned the title, uh, Secret Body. Uh, why this title? Well, like a lot of titles, it's a, it's sort of, it, it has many levels. Uh, it's an English translation of Corpus Mysticum, this Latin expression for the mystical body, which comes out of my own Catholic past but also neatly describes what I think are the two halves of my work. The first half of my corpus, which would be Kali's Child, Roads of Excess, and The Serpent's Gift, are really all about corpus. They're really all about embodiment and particular male sexual orientation and male mystical literature. And the second half of my body of work uh, is really captured well by mysticum because they're very much about the nature of mind or consciousness. So that would cover Esselin, uh authors, mute and mutants and mystics. Um, so that's, that's on one level what the, the title is about. It's the two halves of the book. On another level, it, just, it simply refers to this deeper subtext of the body of work, what, what ties it all together, what's not said explicitly, but is being explored implicitly throughout all the different, different books. Yeah, and you make a point, uh, which I think is good, and we'll we'll turn this into a question. Uh, embodiment as a term is more or less essential, and I guess arguably materialist essentialist, uh, in any kind of, dare I say, pedestrian humanities access, uh, analysis rather, nowadays. And uh, yeah, you write right. 
The body now overflowed any and all ordinary notions of embodiment we find in the academy or the biomedical world. So what do you let, unpack that for us? So what, what is, what is body that is bigger than embodiment as typically used or utilized in the humanities? Well, that, that line actually comes from the second half of the book that's try, oh, actually the opening of the second half of the book into the, the mystical. And essentially what I'm trying to say there is that the way embodiment is usually treated in the academy and in the study of religion is it's a way to lock down all religious experience into some kind of material body that's socially and politically located. It's a kind of reductionism. And that's all well and good and, and actually works quite well, but it leaves out all of these other forms of embodiment, which are about really some form of transcendence or some kind of cosmic nature that is also our body. So things like, you know, what about the bodies that people inhabit and experience in an out-of-body experience or a near-death experience? What about all those experiences people report in which the entire natural world becomes their body. Um, so there, there are other forms of embodiment that get left off the table or are not allowed on the table in those sort of classical reductive moves that, that are so common in the academy. And in the second part of the book, I'm trying to push in to these other forms of embodiment from, again, subtle bodies or out-of-body experiences to things like you know, conscious plasmas or bodies of light. It's good you mentioned the uh, experience of universe as body, because when I first heard the title, that's, you, you know, you just said it had multiple meanings. That was the immediate right. meaning that it presented itself to me, secret body. Oh, the universe, like in that, in that sort of cosmic <laughs> connected sense. Yeah. Well, I actually invoked that, of course, at the beginning of the second part, where, you know, that that is another uh, meaning of secret body. Yeah, I think it is. Well, it is the secret body. You know, that's the, that's the one yeah. you have. <laughs> right. It's the one we're an expression of. Yeah. Well, uh, I guess one of the reasons a lot of this stuff is left out of the more common use of embodiment in the humanities is because you've just described some things that are largely verboten. So, uh, what is what definition of esotericism? should we be using here, which I know is also in the book, and I quite like it. Yeah, so the subtitle is Erotic and Esoteric Currents in the History of Religions. And again, that names the two halves of the book. In the second half of the book, I, I start to look at these forms of esotericism. And here I've been deeply informed by a lot of the European scholars, Walter Honegroff and Marco Pazzi, and um, Koku von Stukrad, people like that. And in particular, Honegroff's notion that esotericism on one level is, is any form of rejected or forbidden knowledge in Western culture. But on a deeper level, I think what defines something as esoteric, at least in the West, is that it comes out of a Neoplatonic emanationist cosmology in which there is no ultimate difference between the natural world and the divine. Um, what becomes orthodox or public in Western culture, religiously speaking, is some form of theism, which implies some kind of creation in which the natural world is not God, is not divine, is somehow separate from the divine. Hence the, the doctrine of creatio ex nihilo, or creation out of nothing, where these esoteric movements tend to reject that and look a lot more like Plotinus or some form of Neoplatonism in which all things, all matter is a kind of efflux or, or energetic emanation of a divine source and so is really not separate from that source. It might be distant from that source, but ultimately it's not separate from it. Um, and so I think that's really kind of at the core of what makes something esoteric uh, for me. Uh, and then, of course, all of the political and intellectual disciplinings that happen to literally make things esoteric. I mean, this is why people won't talk about their anomalous experiences today, is they're 
essentially afraid that they'll be made fun of or mocked. Um, so I, I think there are political and social reasons, but I also think there are deeper theological and philosophical features. Well, um, speaking of theology, we should uh, we should talk Jesus. I learn in this book, you also had a hot Jesus in your church growing up. <laughs> well, I, I went, did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I went to well, I went to a grammar school that uh, had Christchurch Cathedral, which is Newcastle's cathedral there, and where my mentor group would sit was at an angle where you could see. Um, I guess the throes of passion on the cross did really good things to the glutes because uh, <laughs> it was, and this was an Anglican church as well, but it was the gayest yeah. statue I <laughs> uh, I remember seeing in, in childhood. And there's, a, there's some really good uh, analysis, I guess, of, of, of the implications of that uh, in the book. So I, I guess what is contemporary, almost intra-Christian uh, discourse missing about this? Well, this goes, you know, this goes back to the earliest years of my intellectual and spiritual development in in a, in a Catholic seminary uh, in the early '80s, and this is what ultimately drives me into the academy. Was, you know, this sort of early intuition? I, I wouldn't call it a realization because it wasn't very clear at that point, but eventually it becomes clear that there's a kind of internal homoerotic structure to to at least Catholicism um, that I grew up in, and that the divine is this beautiful male uh, whom with to whom you relate if if you're a man or a woman, but for a man it becomes it becomes this kind of sublimated homoerotic relationship uh, and hence all of the you know the the crucifixes with the the muscly and and agonizing Jesus on them. There's something vaguely erotic about the iconography. Uh, and I was struck in the seminary that this w- did indeed attract uh, men who who were gay and for whom this form of devotion offered them a, a positive and very powerful expression of their not just their sexual desires, but also their spiritual desires. Uh, And yet, these same sexualities were condemned and vilified by the same church uh, in its public face, its public teachings. And I was just so puzzled by that as a young man and morally um, tortured by it. I, I was deeply disturbed by the hypocrisy of that and by what that all meant. And so it was really that that question that drove me into the academy and that had started me on this road to thinking about religion uh, on a deeper level, that religion isn't what it appears to be, that there's always another side to it, and that internally it can work in really opposite ways to what it appears to look like from the outside. Uh, and and so that was that was really the driving question for me. And there's, it's it's not just the the iconography either, is it? I mean, if you actually look at, actually, we'll we'll do this question first. What is the criterion of embarrassment when doing New Testament analysis? Well, you look for passages in the New Testament that were kept, despite the fact that they would cause great embarrassment and problems for the believing community or later interpreters, and so. The what New Testament critics essentially say is, if you look at those particular passages, they're almost certainly original with Jesus because there'd be no other reason to keep them. You'd want to, you'd want to erase them if you could, and the only reason you wouldn't erase them is if you were sure that they were original and, and hence sacred. And so, in the context of kind of looking at, I mean, we can't use a modern term like gay and backcast it to, you know, um, the first century. But there are, it's not just the iconography that um, you kind of unpack in this, is it? There's actually quite a bit about this God-man that is, at the very least, homoerotic. Yeah, I mean, so there's a lot of wonderful New Testament criticism on the way 
Jesus' sexualities are remembered and portrayed, not just in the New Testament text, but in the literature around it, and of course the literature that comes after it. And what's so striking about the new the Jesus of the Gospels is that he's not straight in any modern sense. I mean, for one thing, he's not married, so he's not a married man. Uh, his beloved disciple is another man, uh, and he encourages his closest disciples to castrate themselves. The famous, you know, become eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven passage in Matthew. Um, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. There are all these other hints and suggestions throughout the Gospels of a uh, of a real prophet and charismatic preacher who was... Uh, also marginal in his desires and in his gender. And so that's, that fits into this larger thesis I have about this, you know, the general homoerotic nature of, of Christianity with respect to men. There's also, I mean, uh, that's quite a good exploration of the uh, foundational ritual being some sort of we not weird um, some sort of subtextual oral act. Well, yeah, you're talking about the Eucharist. I mean, yeah. so the 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 Euc- what what the Catholic tradition calls the Eucharist or the the Last Supper, if you have other language for it, is you know was deeply offensive to at least in the Gospel of John. It's portrayed as this outrageous act of, you know, eating the body and drinking the, the blood of, of this God-man, um, which, again, um, you know, you're communing, you're consuming the, the body of another man. Um, if, if I were to go up to communion and someone were to say, this is the body of, of Christi, you know, I, as an American male, I would immediately assume some kind of sexual symbolism in me eating the body of a woman. Uh, but we just do that without thinking about it because it's the body of, of a man. So it kind of, it just kind of escapes us or gets around us, but it clearly has these kind of sexual dimensions to it that we just don't normally think about. Um, so that's, 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 I think what you're trying to get at, Gordon. Yeah, absolutely. And I, just jumping back to the previous answer where the criterion of embarrassment kind of surfaces this uh, wonder worker who was politically probably sexually marginal, at least by the standards of the time. And you have a great section yeah. in there. Uh, so what is trans morality, Dr. Kreipel? Well, so you're referring to another chapter in which I'm looking at I'm I'm looking at charismatic gurus in the 1980s and 90s, many of whom were dethroned essentially through various sexual scandals, and I'm trying to tease out w- the mistakes that I think devotees uh, and moralists both make, if in opposite directions. I'm I'm trying to argue that charisma and sexuality are often connected; they they go together. And that these charismatic gurus and spiritual teachers, in fact, had incredible spiritual power. They, they could send someone into a mystical state just by looking at them or touching them. So they, they clearly had the mojo, as it were. Um, but they also were transgressive sexually. They often had sex with their disciples. And what the moralists get wrong is that they assume that if someone does something transgressive, there must not be anything spiritual involved, that it, they're just nothing but a fraud or nothing but a, a, a hoaxer. Uh, and the devotees get it wrong as well because they assume that the guru or teacher is entirely pure and that, again, if they had any kind of sexual life, they must not be a real saint or a real guru. And basically... All I do in that chapter is say, look, it's very clear in the historical record that people can be sexually active and even do things that are immoral by any any social standard, and yet they still have this spiritual power. They still can induce these states. So clearly, 
what we think of as the mystical and the ethical are not the same thing and, and may in fact have nothing to do with each other. Um, you know, I mean, to, to put it extremely, I, I can have the most profound religious experience of my life in a car accident. Uh, I can drive my Toyota and smash it into an oak tree and have an out-of-body experience and become one with God and experience unconditional love and come back into the body and be changed for the rest of my life. Well, does that mean the car crash was a moral event? No. It, it remains a traumatic event that I don't want to repeat under any circumstance, but but it somehow opened me up to these spiritual experiences. And I think a lot of times sexual trauma works like that um, in these mystical contexts. I'm not, I'm not um, defending it. I'm, I'm, in fact, my separation of the ethical and the mystical allows me to condemn these acts, but at the same time affirm that people, yes, have these spiritual experiences. And that's essentially what I say in that chapter. And that's, that's a difficult one, Gordon, for people to hear. Um, they want their saints to be pure saints, and they they don't want them to have anything to do with anything else. And of course, that's seldom the case. It also struck me that it's not. I mean, that's a great answer, and it, it, but it's not just a way of looking at or, or or holding in your head the idea that the person can be a saint and also transgressive it may even be baked into like i'm just reminded a lot of the of the 20th century sort of trickster research that 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 trans moral act in a, in a ritual setting uh yeah. may in fact be in Induce some way something. responsible for the kind of supernormal capacities of the saints in the first place like is there a sort of mechanism that we can squint down to here and speculate on well, I think so. I mean, th this is where I struggle, Gordon. I mean, I I don't know, but it it certainly seems to me that you know, take take something like a paranormal experience. I mean, these often happen in anti-structural moments. Uh, you know, as George Hansen would say, that these these things spike in periods of social unrest or personal crisis, uh, and that. You know, the sacred often appears in the gaps, as it were. Um, when everything is stable and and da and just going extremely well, and we're happy and content and normal, and we live in the suburbs with a golden retriever and two and a half kids, uh, you know, we tend not to be mystics or magicians. Uh, it's it's in the gaps. It's it's in crisis. It's in illness. It's in trauma. It's in the non ordinary states that the, that these things tend to happen. So that's again what I mean by the transmoral. It's not a rejection of morality or or a denial that we have to live in a in, in a social system that has rules. It's that what we think of as ultimate is not social. It does not play by our rules. And I think that's probably why these transgressive behaviors often are associated with the eruption of, of, of the sacred or the eruption of spirit in, in the modern world. It also invites us to kind of look at how this may have been operationalized in initiatory experiences around the world. I, I, I know there are some in, yeah. in New Guinea where you, um, the threshold of manhood, uh, it's crossed by performing oral sex on an older member of the tribe. And, and, and you think there's something, and it's, it's much more acute when you get to some, you know, things like Tantra, but like specifically mystic initi initiations. But it just seems that you can kind of, there's a framework for interpreting why the rituals work they, the way they do. Right. I mean, that is what we call transgression in the study of religion. Transgression doesn't mean anything goes all the time. It means there's a, a strong moral or social system in place, and when you violate that, those social norms or that social system, you experience a kind of rush of, of energy or excitement because, or fear because you're in fact breaking through your own social system. Um, 
and that can be liberating. It can also be destructive, frankly. I mean, it, it can go either way. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that, that's essentially what I was trying to get at in that particular chapter. Yeah, let's... Uh, let's um... All right, I'll just throw this one out there. I have a bunch of questions as I read through the book, uh, as you can probably tell. Uh, is religion a legitimate form of science fiction? I think it is. I, you know, so that's one of the definitions I play with in the book. And, okay, so what do I mean by that? Well, first of all, I borrowed it um, from a, a wonderful sociologist of religion. Um, but what I mean by it is, if you think about religion, it it all it involves these sort of superhumans with special powers coming out of the sky and, and doing strange things to human beings, endowing them with technology and agriculture and special forms of knowledge, and it's all about human beings wanting to somehow go back to the stars or go into the heavens, by which they meant the stars. <laughs> um, so it. It sounds a lot like science fiction, and, and but the difference is, of course, we don't really get science fiction until the 19th and 20th century, and the people who created it, of course, created it as fiction, whereas the religions are practicing it as real in some deep sense, and that's hence the adjective legitimate. Um, I I think also religion is created or written by us in ways that we don't understand and that we usually don't take responsibility for. I mean, I think it's truly fictitious, but I think it's also enchanted. I think it's real in some sense and it's fiction in other sense. And how to tease those two apart, really, you know, I take the whole book trying to do that, of course. So it's um. It's a koan, you know? Religion is, is legitimate science fiction, which, of course, means we, we have more power than we think we do because we, we can rewrite our, our story. And then, again, that's essentially what I'm trying to say. We've had this discussion with some of the premium members a number of times. Uh, you will find the majority of cultures around the world, like ev even the concept of fiction, uh, as as a as a bookstore category, frankly, uh, has to emerge yeah. in a culture that did two things, which is define which texts are true and which ones are false, which we spent fifteen hundred right. years doing, and then we kind of went full empiricist with the Enlightenment and and sort of actualized the material as real. So it, if you go to an Amazonian tribe or spend time with Australian Aborigines, they have stories. They don't have this one is fiction, this one is mythology, this one no. is real. And it seems right. we're kind of baked into and that's what I like about you saying it's it's fiction but it's enchanted. Because yeah. there are especially in science fiction, you think of someone like Philip K. Dick, you have uh, prophetic science fiction. It, things seem to match subsequent reality. Where are they getting that from? It, that, that comes from their head, whatever that means, but it's enchanted. Yeah. And you, and it's, we kind of, uh, there are so many, which is the second half of the conversation, of course, there are so many ideological structures that we have mistaken for true until we, um, you know, interrogate them a bit. And, and, and the F word is one of them, I think. Fiction. Yeah. Yeah, because there's a lot of F-words, Gordon. Oh, yes. I, I'm a fan of most of them. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we'll move I, into I think, yeah, I just, I just think that's the koan that, or the rabbit hole we fall down when we start thinking about religion as legitimate science fiction. Because, of course, before there was science fiction, people didn't have any other way then religion to express these intuitions and these instincts. Uh, once there is science fiction, of course, these religious impulses can move into science fiction, and then you know it's a different game because you you can always you always have deniable plausibility. You just say, "Oh, I'm just writing fiction," but before there is fiction, uh, that's not so clear. Um, and and I'm not sure. I I don't want to suggest that you we can take our form of consciousness and project it back into pre-modernity because I don't think we can. 
I, so it's really hard for us to understand what someone might have been doing. Uh, like with the early theosophy, for example, which is sort of arose at the same time as early science fiction, it's, a lot of it sounds like science fiction again, and yet I, I don't think that's what they intended or that's what they were doing. It was a different form of, of, of mind, I think. Nevertheless, it does kind of allow a fresh what I what I like about it, a Cohen is a good description because you kind of jump into this pool and when you resurface you have a uh, you go in looking for religion and you resurface and in the your left hand you have an improved uh, conception of religion and in your right hand you have a com- improved conception of fiction. So it's, it's yeah. you you kind of yeah. come back with both. And with that in yeah. mind you do get to look at something like the various Gnostic texts and go, well, they, fiction, there were no, there's barely any bookstores today, but there were no bookstores, uh, no borders or uh, Barnes and Noble for <laughs> these guys to go to and think, well, where is nope. the Gnostic section? And you think, what are they doing with these texts? And, and also the approach to them. So this is, we can't get into that head, which is, is the writing of it as or more important than the subsequent reading of it? And, and this is, Really good stuff, I think, for people to think with. Yeah, well, that's certainly the intention. I mean, I hope you got from the book that I don't have these answers. I'm just sort of struggling with them on the page, and I I come to these, you know, I come to 20 of these sort of tentative intuitions or convictions, but it's it's a very much an open-ended book. Oh, absolutely. And uh, no, I wasn't looking for an answer there, although I have some doozies for you at the back end of the show that you can't leave without answering because they're driving me crazy. But uh, okay. <laughs> we'll get okay. into them. Uh, you write, because this, this is just my absolute jam, you write, comparativism and mysticism are historically, psychologically, and philosophically linked. How is that? Well... For one thing, some of the greatest historical mystics understood or sought out confirmation of their experiences in other cultures and in other religious systems. So, for example, Plotinus, you know, had this mysterious teacher, Ammonia Sacchus, and had these series of mystical experiences of the noose and felt compelled to travel to India to no doubt, to confirm or to seek more teachings about this cosmic form of mind that he experienced or was taught. So, and you can find lots and lots of other cases like that. It's not that every mystic is interested in comparing. That's not what I'm saying. It's that when you have a mystical experience of consciousness or of God or of something transcendent, By definition, if it's transcendent, it must be able to be found in other cultural and contexts and other communities. Uh, And so I think often people who are interested in mysticism are interested in comparativism. And we know, I think we know with great certainty that the history of comparativism in the 20th century is strongly linked to the study of mysticism. The, the, The same people who were creating the comparative study religion are, are the same people who are studying mysticism. That, that I think, can be shown without any, any doubt. Um, so, you know, there it's, Gordon, there it's kind of an internal debate. I, I'm writing for people in the study of religion who all know that comparativism is, is supposed to be something bad and apparently went out of fashion about 30 years ago. And I'm trying to argue that it can't go out of fashion because it's it's innate to consciousness. We we compare by instinct and by our cognitive makeup and by the very nature of consciousness. We we compare, um, and so I'm trying to make a lot of arguments there and trying to rehabilitate comparativism as a as a good thing now, not a bad thing. You, I think you're also sneaking in uh, a fairly profound telos to it because i mean it, it kind of comes back to the transmoral discussion so almost a, a, an adequate working definition of uh, a mysticism or a mystic encounter is almost that it has to fall outside the official 
ontology, the, the official reigning ontology. So you find, particularly in, say, in, the, in the history of the saints, that ones like Joan of Arc kind of go either way, like, well, is she a witch? Like, she falls outside the official ontology, and they have to work out, is she a mystic or is she a witch? And and I kind of think that comparison is leaving, is holding more than one framework up next to each other, and that can't not happen with that definition of mysticism, and it, it, it that's the telos in it, right? So looking at the world has... Well, I'll, I'll make this a question. Is uh, What is the Christology of comparison? <laughs> well, that yeah, that's a phrase I use in the book. Um, now, that's a, wow, that's a whole other discussion. Let, let me back up into your first question, and then we can get to the Christology of comparison uh, question. I... I, the reason comparativism, one reason comparativism went out of fashion is that if you do comparativism well, it inevitably dissolves or compromises your own worldview. Because you realize that your own cultural frame or your own religious frame is not absolute. It's, it's simply a cultural frame. And some forms of mysticism, which we call apophatic mysticism, work in the same way. They essentially deny any cognitive or cultural framework for the divine. And so that's another reason I think comparativism and mysticism go together so well, is they both deny the ultimacy of any cultural framework or religion. What I mean by the Christology of comparison, so Christology is this this discipline within Christian theology that tries to tease out the human and divine natures of Christ and how they're related. And I'm certainly not pushing any kind of traditional Christology, but in this book, I am pushing this notion that I call the humanist too. And what I mean by that is that so much of religious experience is the experience of us being two instead of one. In other words, we we have a dream and someone speaks in the dream or someone's telling the dream and it's not us. It's not us as the dreamer. Or we have an out-of-body experience and we experience ourselves outside our body. So our body's not us. We're somebody else. Or we experience our own divinity uh, that's not clearly just this body here. So there are all these different forms of the humanist too. And essentially that's what Christology is about, is, is how Jesus was two, two natures in, in one person. And my argument in the book is essentially that my, that's actually my anthropology. I, I don't think that's restricted to one historical Jewish rabbi who lived a little over 2,000 years ago. I think that two-ness describes all human beings, and is the best way into doing comparison, because our external kind of social ego is always can always be reduced or explained by our lo- local culture and our local historical context. But this other side of us, this other this otherness or alien in us, cannot be. It it seems to be outside of time in some way, and and maybe even outside of space. And that's why someone in the 21st century can have an experience that's essentially identical to the one Plotinus had in the 3rd century or the 2nd century, Um, because there's a part of us that's not in space or time. But of course, most of us is in space and time. Most of us is just Gordon or or, or Jeff. Um, And so that's what I mean. That's a long-winded answer, but that's essentially what I'm trying to get at. It's great, and it's also teed up the uh, the really difficult question, which I don't have an answer for, uh, and it's been going round and round in my head. So you'll have to listen to kind of where I'm at with this. So um, okay. you've just kind of described, uh, which I agree with, a sort of baseline epistemology that is not in alignment with uh, how at least public humanities discourse happens. So comparison has a tendency to get kind of cock-blocked by a lot of this POMO, 
post-colonial materialist, materialist notions of appropriation and so on, which are things that right. have historically happened. Uh, and you get, right. you know, the likes of Eduardo Viveros de Castro pointing out that by blocking it off, by saying, nope, can't go there, it actually has the opposite effect, because what it does is encodes the primacy of that kind of Western materialist universalism as true with a capital T. Yep. And it makes yep. the, every non-Western epistemology relativized and small like a, like the museum objects right so they yep. don't they don't get a full ontology out of it so my first yep. question is how how do we solve for that like what is is this baseline epistemology do, do we just have to kind of take the eggs and the rotten fruit that's thrown at us and saying, look, there are some universals to human bad news. They're not material. Uh, and, and if we use that as the base, then I feel like we have a, um, a, a, a more appropriate baseline epistemology for this comparison. Yeah. So, okay. So that's, you've nailed really what the project is in the second half of the book, which, which I carry under the umbrella of the new comparativism. And basically, what I say is, look, there's three things. We, well, there's really four things. The first thing I think we have to do is we have to acknowledge that all of those reductive social political uh, analyses are correct. I mean, they essentially do good work, uh, and they're they're right. The problem is is they're right about only some things. They're they're part. They're. It's not that they're wrong. It's that they're. It's that they're half right. That's the problem. They're right about this side of the human is too that is local and historical and and culturally and politically conditioned. But they're absolutely wrong about this other side of the human is too, which is experiences itself as transcendent and and is not bound by the local cultural or social context. And that's why I offer this notion of the humanist too, because it can take in all of the postmodern, all the historical stuff, all the ideological critique, and say, okay, that's correct as far as it goes, but then there's all this other stuff that it can't explain, and it has its own level of truth too, and we, we, have, to, we have to engage it as well. Um, and so that's... That's essentially the first move. I, I'm a big fan of psychoanalysis. I'm a big fan of gender theory. I'm a big fan of Michel Foucault and all these people. But they weren't omniscient, and none of these people were, were God. They're, they're, just, they're, vo- they're important voices, but they don't, they don't speak to the entire human experience. Um, and so if you remember, Gordon, I, I offer sort of three steps to this new comparativism. The first one is is critique, in which I point out, or in which I suggest the first thing we have to do is what you just did, which is to show that all of these moves that are important nevertheless assume Western materialism, and that they themselves are ideological moves. Okay, that's step one. Step two is we need to engage contemporary anomalous mystical experiences and use them as our comparative base to look at texts and rituals and acts in the past, which will then bring those historical materials alive and put them in conversation with contemporary experiences. The third step is we have to engage in speculative metaphysics. We have to offer other models of explanation for why, for example, it's possible that someone can dream of a plane crash that isn't going to happen till tomorrow, or why someone knows instantly that her husband or his, his wife has just passed away 500 miles away in a car. We, there are other metaphysical options here that can embrace materialism as part of the answer, but not is all of it. And and so those are the three steps I think we have to take. And let me just say one more thing, because this is really important. Often when I voice this, uh, professional intellectuals will say, well, Jeff, no, we have to be agnostic about these metaphysical issues, because we don't know, and, and that's how scholarship proceeds. My response to that is, no, 
we can't be agnostic because if we take an agnostic position, all the dials will just reset back to materialism. Exactly. It's just kicking the can down the road. It's- You're just kicking it down the road. Materialism is the base metaphysics of the entire Western Academy and of most of Western culture. And if you do not speculate ontologically, metaphysically, all the dials just reset and we're right back where we started from. Um, and and I really I really feel strongly about that. No, one hundred percent. But that's that's definitely a mar- That's definitely not the consensus opinion, of course. But that's that's I think where we have to go. Well, you um, and I think it's true. You, I recall you wrote the intro to a previous podcast guest, uh, Jack Hunter's book on on Charles Fort, uh, and he yeah. he introduced the concept of ontological flooding, which is a sort of anthropological version of what you're talking about in in, in comparison yeah. here, which I describe it as is. being the guy from um, the EPA in the original Ghostbusters film who sort of opens the containment unit and just haunts all of New York. Uh, I think <laughs> the, the sort of psi or supernormal, if you want, baseline epistemology needs to, um, like... That's the line in the sand. No, you have to get there, uh, especially as, you know, I think we're right and they ha- they're evidence-free. Uh, that needs to be centered um, to do it. But, like, this, here's, the, here's a more challenging question when we're talking about comparativism, and it's something I believe you mentioned the first time you were on the show. Uh, when we're talking about comparativism and comparing cultures, specifically mystic or um, spiritual or religious paths, there is this is curly uh why to sort of paraphrase you does from a cultural and spiritual perspective dancing with the one what brung you seem to work better for most people we both have a different but similar background of uh, exploring spiritual traditions outside of one's own kind of birth culture uh and it's it's certainly been my experience and a lot of people I talk to that um I have encountered a greater level of profundity in my own. And this is the sort of, that's at the back of, I guess, getting comparativism wrong. There's how do we solve the risk of ethnocentrism? uh, And like, on one hand, you have ethnocentrism. On the other hand, you have this kind of new universality of the human experience of the sacred. And, uh, and I don't, I genuinely don't know how that works. I've got this best guess, which is a sort of haunted or jailbroken, I guess, phenomenology. But that catches me in this infinite loop, right? Because of phenomenology's kind of troubling historical dalliance with ethno-nationalism. So, like, it might have this solve for how you can experience, how potentially the experience of the sacred is possibly more available to your consciousness, I guess, if you interact locally or or as it's locally expressed. But the trouble with that is it was literally built to justify that for European nationalist reasons. So I cannot, this is my infinite loop with comparativism, 100% there with the baseline epistemology, 100% there with its telos. And yet, why does dancing with the one what brung you seem to work better in a lot of cases. I, it's it's curly, and I please solve it for me. Free me from this prison, Dr. Jeff. <laughs> I'm not sure I can, Gordon. I, I'm not sure I understand the question, to be really honest. Why, are you asking why one's own birth culture often works better than going outside Sp- it? Spiritually, yes. So why, why, what do we get more out of that? Uh, and it's, this isn't like a... Um, a, an Anglo culture thing, either. This is this is sort of the. This has been experienced for for decades in in kind of non white yet Western cultures that there is a, a, a profundity in looking at. Uh, there are above uh, effects that you would expect that are kind of greater if you are African American and. Um, discover African diaspora traditions. Same thing with Karandarismo. If you're, uh, you know, um, is is it simply that you are kind of trans moralizing out of Western materialism? It's like I don't understand how. Do you know what I mean? I feel like there's a risk when we talk about comparison and 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 culture 
And I don't yeah. know what the intellectual or descriptive or epistemological soul for that is. Yeah. All right. I don't. Uh, let me just take a stab because I'm not sure I still understand. But I'll, I think if we talk around it, we might be able to to orbit in. Um, first of all, I don't think it's true always that people experience the most profundity in their home birth culture. I think definitely not always some, true. Definitely not. Yeah, but certainly often, and I think there could be both simple and profound reasons for that. I mean, on a simple level, you you simply have the linguistic and cultural tools to tap into those resources in a more profound way than you do in another culture. For example, I I can't tap into Chinese culture at all because I don't know Chinese and I have no tools and my imagination hasn't been informed by the culture and I I don't I don't speak or read it. So I'm sort of shut off from all of those worlds. Um, but on another, so on another profound, more much more profounder level, and this is purely speculative. But you know, the last chapter of the book is on Ian Stevenson and reincarnation memories, and a lot of these memories do pass on through families. And I sometimes wonder about the genetic or or reincarnation dimensions of what you're talking about. I mean, and I don't, I'm not, I'm not making an argument reducing reincarnation memories or spiritual inclinations to genes and and chromosomes. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that maybe genes and chromosomes are some kind of material expression of what we think of as reincarnation or what we think of as these spiritual inclinations. There's some kind of occult or paranormal biology at work or something. Um, now the danger there is that leads into all kinds of you know occult nationalisms or something. Correct. And I'm not I'm not <laughs> saying I'm not saying that either, but but I do wonder I do wonder about you know whether there might be something something there. And I think we can affirm I think people can affirm their own ethnic and and cultural identities without absolutizing them. Right? I mean, I don't know what I don't see anything particularly wrong with engaging one's own cultural matrix as long as one doesn't start arguing that everyone in the world should honor this cultural matrix as somehow absolute. That, that's ridiculous. Yeah, that's, yeah, uh, I'm loving uh, this bit. And I think, yeah. and I think so I think a, compa- a truly comparative orientation always has to balance sameness and difference. You know, if if all you honor is difference, everybody's different, it's all about difference, then we have nothing to connect us. We have nothing, no way to speak to each other. But if we're all the same, then we've erased our differences and not honored our specificities. And so I think comparison is not about swallowing all difference in some kind of sameness, but it's also not about swallowing sameness in complete difference. It's just keeping those two things in, in balance. And, and, and I think that's, again, the, a, a kind of expression of what I call the humanist too. Um, because at least when I speak to another human being from another culture, I recognize immediately that that person is as much a person as I am as much a human being as I am. We're, we're the same. But I also recognize that we're very different. And that sounds so banal and so obvious, but it's astonishing to me how we fail at that. We yeah. fail at that basic, basic respect for sameness and difference over and over and over again. And in our political lives, we fail because we can't respect each other's differences and in the academic world, we fail because we want to deny all sameness. Well, this is, and yeah, like, so I don't, st- I don't see why we can't do both. Well, that is why I want to put it in your step three. You have, we need to engage in speculative metaphysics. I would like to table this exact area as first cab off the rank for that, because we have, if you look at the kind of, particularly Anglo-American historical perspectives of other cultures. We have a a 19th century Church of Progress racial model, wrong. We have the 20th century materialist um, postmodern atomization of 
um, that universality that must be there somewhere wrong. And I think the reason we're both struggling with this, I certainly am, is uh, we we haven't we all need to kind of get in this and 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 do that speculative metaphysics because it's even just difficult to talk about, but we know it's in there yeah. and we know it's in there and we know we need to do it. And Gordon, I, th- I mean, I think, look, I, I think we should be mourning a lot of our past. And, and this is where I, I'm in complete solidarity with, you know, these post-colonial and these feminist and these, these Marxist critiques of, of how, Western culture has treated uh, basically non-white people and and other cultures. I think we have to struggle with that. Yep. Um, but again, that doesn't mean that you know we that every act of engaging another culture is some kind of secret colonial act. That's I think that's that's too easy. Um, it's just too easy. And and I think there are good reasons to be fascinated by other cultures and to want to engage them and incorporate what they have to say in in our own worldview. I think that's healthy. Um, they also, as I say in the book, there you go. Go ahead. There you go. I, you know, as I say in the book, I when I when I was you know working on India, I actually think India is special. I. I think it has something to offer the world that is absolutely unique when it comes to, particularly when it comes to mystical experience and philosophy of mind and you know but today that in in the academy that will only be read as some form of orientalism or some yeah, no. form of yeah. secret colonialism and I'm like uh no uh if you just look at indian philosophy and then you look at european philosophy there's no comparison Indian philosophy has chosen to focus on these issues, and they have, you know, a thousand words for consciousness in Sanskrit or whatever it is, and we have like five in Latin or something. I don't know. I'm I'm exaggerating, but my point is is that different cultures focus on different things, and so if you want are interested in thing A or thing X, you want to go to that culture that's specialized in that, and I don't. I just fail to see why that's such a horrible thing. I, to me, it's a form of respect and love. It's not a. It's not a form of appropriation and and neo-colonialism. Yeah, this is almost the other side of what I was trying to get at uh, of the kind of net effects of. Um, kind of going it's the other side of it it literally is the other side of going into your local or birth culture there are net effects there and it's the it's the other side of it which is i also being interested in the world i'm not there there are ways of thinking with and learning from uh, and exploring that aren't appropriative or colonizing no they're the opposite yeah, I think they are the opposite. And funnily enough, the example I was going to use earlier um, to do with how we do need to do that morning is from the the 90s when we had, in Australia, prior to the internet, things got here very late. So we got our own Reagan in the 90s, and that was John Howard. And it's it's a classic Reagan in the sense that very good for the economy, very bad for um, you know, workplaces and so on, and kind of racist. So he refused to uh, apologize for the 70 years of forced abductions of Aboriginal children and, and being put into facilities. He didn't apologize. And the trouble was, in Aboriginal context, sorry isn't a admission of guilt. If a bad things hap- if bad things happen, everyone comes together and it's called sorry business, and they sit around and mourn. And the prime minister at the time was assuming sorry meant I did something wrong and I'm not going to apologize for that because I didn't, which, by the way, he didn't technically because it happened prior to, you know, him being right. prime minister. And there's this, right. there's this fundament, and we had to learn that, that no, sorry business is a really bad thing has happened to everyone, to this country, and we need to sit around and and explore that and feel that and mourn that and this is this is the stuff that happens these are the new ideas well the reinvigorated ideas new to us um that can happen in that process right but you have to engage it yeah and you have to be 
you know, to do a comparison again, you have to be you have to have a sufficient level of self reflexivity. And by that I mean you have to inhabit a psychological and spiritual form of mind in which you can separate from your own beliefs and your own thoughts. You you essentially have to be able to not believe your beliefs and not think your thoughts. And to entertain the notion or the possibility that your thoughts and beliefs are just wrong or, or just limited. And and once you can do that, though, then you can move into almost any worldview and appreciate the worldview, but also be critical of it again, because obviously it's just another worldview. It's not absolute either. And so that <laughs> that's a tough one, right? I mean, that's that's hard for people to do. They want to they want to believe their own worldview is somehow the norm for all of humanity and all of time and space, and it it's simply not true. It's never true, ever. And this comes back to, which is a, a neat final question. This comes back to shifting that baseline epistemology because not only you know, there are people who can't do that. And there are people who think they're doing that, um, but they're, they're doing the worldview relativization from within the context of this kind of naturalist, materialist model right. that they don't see as the model. So that, it, that, right. that's the one that needs to get kicked up into, actually, I also mean that one. <laughs> I also mean the one that you're using. Right. Be- because because what the other thing they do, of course, not only do they not question materialism, but they don't see how their assumptions keep all these things off the table. And, you know, they can keep saying, but we've, we've shown this and this and this. And my response is, you've only shown that because you've kept all this other stuff off the table. If you put all this weird shit on the table again, you, it's clear you did you can make a lot of cool stuff, but it's clear you actually can't explain how the world works. The world doesn't work like you say it does. It only works like you say it does in this little corner over here because you've taken everything off the table you can't explain. And, and that's, that's the deeper work I think we have to do is, is really admit what we've taken off the table and, and then put it back on the table again. And uh, so then, what role does imagination have to play in doing that? Everything. I mean, oh, it's a long, it's another long conversation. But I think the way we've framed the imagined is is purely the imaginary. It's just fantasy. It's just stuff in our head. It has no ontological basis. It has nothing to do with the real world. Whereas so much of of uh, paranormal experience, or it's precognitive, or telepathic, or apparitional, absolutely is engaging the imagination. But it's somehow engaging the imagination to access truth about the actual physical or spiritual world. And again, we just have no way of thinking that because we've we've defined the imagination as just the imaginary. And um, I, it's just a huge problem. It's, it's and it's it's unique. It's unique in the world to currently whatever it is, eleven to fourteen percent of the population. It's unique in in time, and we've the the extra level of hypocrisy in this materialism is it still has that eighteenth nineteenth century European primacy, which is we're right and everyone else everywhere in all time is wrong, and it's just kills me. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's true, it's true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and that is colonizing, by the way. Yeah, I, I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> absolutely. All right, lucky last one. Uh, having you know, this has been—it's a remarkable book. Honestly, it is one of the best books I've read in years. I, uh, you should see the state of it with all the post-it notes and, uh, and so on. <laughs> Good. Uh, but I mean, this is this is a professional and academic journey for you, and it's also the journey of Jeff as two through the cosmos. Uh, do right. you do you have a daily spiritual practice? I do, I do, and I don't. I mean, I do in the sense I, I get up early every morning and I I write or read or write and I meditate. Uh, but I'm I'm afraid I don't do any of those things very well. But but I certainly have a spiritual practice. Um, as you know from our earlier conversations, I I approach reading and writing as essentially a paranormal practice. I think it's profound and has all kinds of consequences. Uh, so when I say I read and I write, I don't 
mean I'm reading the newspaper and you know writing post-its. I, I mean I'm tr- really engaging serious authors and trying to refashion reality around me. Um, so that's definitely my practice. Wonderful. Well, um, it's always a pleasure talking to you, Dr. Kripal. Uh, this is genuinely a fantastic book. So congratulations. And, and all the all the details on, on where to get it will be in the show notes. But if there's anything else you'd like people to look at or got coming up, uh, lay it on them. Um, I've got a I've got a book coming out in the fall called Changed in a Flash. Uh, it's with a local woman here in Houston who was um, struck by lightning and had this amazing near death experience, and then became something of a paranormal prodigy. So look for that. Maybe we can talk about that in the fall. Oh, I I would love to. Brilliant. All right. Well, again, <laughs> I it's a fantastic discussion. Thank you for. Uh, you know, opening the the prison I'm stuck in a little bit. Uh, I'm I'm really glad we, um, yeah. I I'm speechless. It's it's such a, okay. it's such a good book. Well, it's mutual. <laughs> it's a mutual fan club. I always point people to your 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 show. It's 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 the best out there. So keep keep up the good work. Dr. Jeff Kripal, ladies and gentlemen. I know it's only March, but Secret Body is already far in the lead for Best Book of the Year for me. We get a lot of authors with recent books on the show because, by and large, that's usually the only time I can get them to talk to little old me. And I try to talk through their ideas so you can make your own decisions about whether you want to go further and so on. That's a big part of the show. In this case, it's a little bit beyond that. It's an actual recommendation. If you're chaos magic inclined, comparativism comes with the territory. And Secret Body is the best place to jump into that. And I hope you do, because, as you could probably tell towards the end, it's really hard to talk about some of this stuff. In physics, in biology, in ecology, in the humanities, we've reached the end of what the outgoing epistemology can offer us. And we're sort of looking over the fence at where we need to be. This is what the dominant of witchcraft presentation in the premium members area is largely about. After we hit stop on the recording, uh, Jeff and I spoke a bit more about uh, India being a special case. And what he said about India, just as an example of this, I need to be able to say about Brazil and spirits, which Jeff agreed was another example, or Aboriginal cultures and star law. And in all of these cases, these assertions clearly need to be supported by evidence, and they need to emerge from this, I guess, new baseline epistemology. The case for India is pretty solid, obviously. It's got three and a half thousand years of history of essentially the study and the practice of a science of mind, right? Brazil not only has a plethora of modern spirit traditions, but it's also home to some of the most spectacular UFO cases in the last 50 years. So there's something about it there. Uh, but you see, you see how hard it is, right? The immediate solve, as far as I can tell, is um, for more hands or even all hands on deck. So that means you kids. Uh, I don't know what happens after that. Probably the next step is to sort of despecialize the category of human, which involves the extension of personhood beyond us into the wider cosmos, uh, and a cosmos in particular that operates on a flow model. So this is the big table animism project. Superiority claims can evaporate in a more-than-human personhood model, and essentialist claims evaporate in a flow model. So we might be better placed to sort of jump over the fence after that. This is weirdly tangential and sort of a, <laughs> an odd recommendation to finish the show on, but consider watching the Netflix program Ugly Delicious for an exploration of the tension between authenticity and innovation, which is a sort of side tension to the main one uh, I'm talking about in this clothing, sort of about birth culture and host culture and so on, obviously from a specifically food-based perspective. And the treatment is as good as you're going to get on a Netflix show, which isn't saying much, uh, but it's yet another example, I think, of how all these older categories emerging from the outgoing epistemology just aren't up to code anymore. Anyway, 
That's it. Great chat. Great book. Details in the show notes, of course. Uh, some more good ones coming up in the following weeks, so be sure to subscribe. Hit up Rune Soup or the Rune Soup Facebook page and find me on Twitter where I am Gordon, G-O-R-D-O-N underscore white, W-H-I-T-E. Until next time. <laughs>